Welcome to the audiobook reading of The God in the Clear Rock. Written and read by me. I can prove it. There it is. Uh, well, it's Thursday evening. It's not quite 9 o'clock yet. I've got about 20 seconds still on my side. So... We'll just wait for a second or two to see what happens. Hmm. All right. Yeah. Well, the recording's fine, but it seems like the upstream is not working well, so we'll just do what we can. All right, do you remember where we were? I'll catch you up when we bring out the timer. They were in the bottom of the pyramid. Remember, Marise saw something behind one of the mummified remains there. She got down on her hands and knees and leaned into the lower torso of the skeleton while she reached around with her arm. Jacinto couldn't help himself when he watched his professor lean into the lap of the dead guard. Uh, boss... I know you're only into old guys. I mean, really old guys, like a couple of thousand years old. But come on, I don't think it's going to work. That's where we stopped off. So now we'll start the timer. Timer is away. Marise sat up and back on her butt as she turned around to see her grad student. You have a dirty mind, young man. She pointed at him with the object of her apparent indiscretion. It was the broken tip of a sword, a Spanish steel sword. The first mystery was solved. The Spanish, most likely conquistadors, did this. This was not really surprising. It was well known the Spanish conquistadors sacked the Yucatan Peninsula, starting in the 1500s and continuing into the 1600s. After that time, the native population of the Maya went into cultural hiding. They blended into the jungle and became true natives once more. They still lived here in the Yucatan. Marise was related to them. Her father had been a full-blooded native. She would never know, but she was directly related to the small boy whose body she and Jacinto had just examined upstairs. Quatsi's family continued to live in the jungle after the temple pyramid was sacked and their youngest son was murdered. There was a direct family lineage, lineage that led to Marise. It was part of the reason she had such a hard time entering this tomb. Jacinto noticed the shiny metal. Whoa, what you got there, senorita? She smiled when she tossed it to him and he clumsily caught it against his chest in the dim LED light. He held it up to his face and used his other hand to adjust the angle of his headlamp. He flipped it over just once, then handed it back to his mentor, like a diamond cutter handing over a gem after an inspection. Spanish steel, dual blade, probably middle 16th century. Jacinto smiled confidently. City of origin, por favor. She smiled even bigger at him. It was pop quiz time, and Jacinto knew it. He also knew he was about to fail. Um, uh, Madrid? He squeaked out his answer, mostly as a question. Marise shook her head at him. Oh, my poor, poor, pitiful pupil. That is not correct. Just for that, you have to carry the object that you know so little about. Then she tossed it back to him, and he caught it in the same clumsy way. Marise chuckled, chuckled under her breath as she turned on her butt and looked again at the fallen royal guard. His right hand was out to the side. It was the one with the machete partially in its grip, but it looked like he was holding himself up with that arm. He couldn't have used it, used the blade to defend himself with it extended under his weight like that. Why do you think this one didn't use his blade to fend off the fatal attack. She was mostly just talking out loud now. Jacinto knew this. He didn't answer. She did it herself moments later. 
Well, maybe he was stabbed first, then died here. No, that can't be it. We just found the tip of the blade that went through his heart. Surely a conquistador wouldn't have thrust his blade so hard into an already dead man that he chipped the blade in the stone behind him. Jacinto loved listening to her when she did this. It was like watching a really hot female Sherlock Holmes. Marise kept talking out loud to herself. No, this one was alive when he was a stab, when he was stabbed. She turned and imitated the sitting position of the dead hero. And the death blow was delivered as he sat up against this wall. She motioned into her chest while she looked at the cadaver. And he never tried to block it with his machete or his other hand. She put her hands into the same position as the dead guard and then looked at them for a moment. Then she turned back and leaned into the crotch of the dead man again. The left arm and hand of the Mayan royal guard was in between his legs. As she looked closely, she could see his fingertips. The skin was all gone from all of them. The skin was gone from all of them. But she could also see the tip of his forefinger. It was crushed, but not flattened like it was stepped on or smashed with a rock. It was pushed in and crushed from the very point of the fingertip. As she sat there for a moment, she saw something else between his legs. On the floor below his mangled fingers was a small curved piece of what looked like stone. Marise reached tenderly between his legs and passed his hand. Jacinto couldn't resist again. Uh, should I wait outside? You could get a room. Marise gave him a sideways look as she continued to sneak her hand in between the mummified legs of the savior of the Mayan god. After her slinger f slender fingertips found the tip of the rock piece, she extracted it just as carefully. When she finally had the piece firmly in her grasp, she slid around on her butt to face Jacinto again. Then she put on a bit of an English accent. Well, well, what have we, gov what have we here, governor? Jacinto loved it when she did that, too. She focused her headlamp and looked at the mysterious piece of carved rock. She could see the remnants of dried, bloody fingerprints on it. Why would this piece of rock be so important he would hold it rather than try to protect his own life. She was talking to herself again. Jacinto knew when she switched from talking to him to talking to herself. He had worked with her for two years. He planned on working with her forever if he could. She was right. Marise was on her way to becoming the most famous archaeologist in the world, bar none, and he wanted to help and get his Ph.D., and then become a tenured university professor. Then he would be happy, maybe. But he would handle that when the time came. In the meantime, he'd made friends with the archaeology legend from his hometown of Miami. Jacinto knew she had moved there when she was a little girl from her home here in the Yucatan. And when she enrolled in the university, she promptly became the female equivalent of a young Indiana Jones, only with perky boobs. By the time she finished her doctorate, she was already known around the world. She had spent every summer while in college back in the Yucatan excavating and discovering. She had a sixth sense for finding sites that had never been discovered. It was like she had been there before in another life. She knew right where they were, almost always. It was kind of spooky. When she discovered this pyramid, she let Jacinto in on the secret before anyone else. Marise had also decided she wanted Jacinto as her assistant. She needed someone who had his drive and sharp mind. Everything Marise ever did was first class, as far as the effort. She had to deal with the realities of research grants and money on everything else. Such was the life of a field re researcher in the modern archaeology game. And it was field research that both Marise and Jacinto loved the most, like right now. Marise was getting on a roll. She reached back and grabbed one of the extension LED lights, then put it next to the cadaver. 
After flipping the LED head around, she pointed it toward the royal guard's left side and illuminated where she was looking earlier. Then she used her headlamp to look over the whole body, starting at the feet. She noticed immediately that several bones on his feet had signs of abrasion from the top. It was the same with both knees, and these were not shallow abrasions. They were deep into the bone. This would have hurt. Maybe he was dragged here on his knees and feet. She was pointing but not touching the cadaver. She was also not looking at Jacinto. She was not taking her eyes off of the royal guard's partially mummified body. She continued traveling up the body with her headlight only inches away from the corpse. Then she pulled out a flashlight from her equipment belt and switched it on. The handheld tactical LED put out a concentrated beam like a miniature spotlight. She moved the bright light over the sides of the guard's legs and then up to his hips. When she got there, she found abrasions on the outside of the upper leg and hip area. But these abrasions went the other direction. They stretched across the leg from the anterior to posterior on the outside of the hip. The other abrasions were lengthways on the body in the same direction as the head to toe line. These deep abrasions went laterally across the side of his upper leg like something was sawing next to his hip. She leaned forward and looked over to the other side of the body with her light. She could see the same marks on the other hip. Marise sat back on her butt again. This time she looked off into the distance and slightly tilted her head. She started thinking out loud again as she picked her knees up in front of her and leaned back on her hands. If you're being dragged face down, then your feet and knees get scraped down the front, like these marks. She looked nonchalantly at the bony feet of the cadaver beside her with her headlamp. But if your feet are out behind you, then how do you get lateral abrasions on both hips? She started bouncing one knee up and down. Jacinto smiled. This meant she was onto something. She was like a book, an extremely complex and beautiful book. But he knew a few of the chapters by heart, like this one. She had something in her head. The only thing missing was, oh, there it was. Marise stuck out her tongue slightly as she was thinking. Now Jacinto knew she had it. The beams from the flashlight and her headlamp lit up the dusty corpse as she suddenly leaned forward to examine the body again. She looked down at the outside of the knees and ankles with the mini spotlight. There were not any abrasions to speak of. Then she carefully reached into the crotch of the royal guard again. This time, she gently lifted his hand as she reached down with her pen light. She saw what she was looking for and carefully put the hand back down. Then she got up on her knees and looked behind the fallen hero. Both of his shoulders were scraped deeply. Finally, she sat back down. He wasn't dragged. He crawled somewhere. Somewhere either very rough, she looked around, the floors were all pretty smooth. Or he did it very quickly. Or maybe over a long distance. Or both. She continued to survey the entire room with her pen light as she slowly spoke to herself. She was doing that Sherlock Holmes thing again. Jacinto wished she would let him videotape her, but she adamantly refused. He eventually stopped asking after she broke his video camera in front of him with the butt of her Smith & Wesson 9mm. He got the message. You didn't have to beat him over the head. Just his camcorder, apparently. She bought him a new one the next week and a six-pack of Corona Lights, his favorite. Marise got up on her knees again, which snapped Jacinto back into here and now. This time, she leaned into the area above the guard's head. She looked around on the front and the left side. Then she stood up and leaned over so she could see the top and the back of his head. Bingo! Marise thought to herself as she focused the spotlight 
on the dead man's skull. On the back of the guard's head was the same sort of deep abrasions she just found on the other body parts of this one Mayan. She quickly turned and walked over to check the other bodies. A cursory glance told her what she wanted to know. None of the other bodies had these marks. Now she approached the Mayan hero's body from its right side. She leaned in close and looked at his face. She tried to imagine how he must have appeared when he was alive. She knew what the gene structure would probably have made him look like. She grew up with the same structure in the mirror. While she was daydreaming, she subconsciously dropped the hand that was holding the powerful pin light down by her side. Marise was just about to pull it back up and look at the dead man's face again when she noticed something. It was on the wall behind the fallen guard. The wall had carvings from floor to ceiling, but the carvings at the top were not the same as the bottom. The bottom had large legs, beaks, and wings of mythical half-man, half-creatures carved in vivid three-dimensional relief. The carvings had spaces behind them where the relief was on the back wall. It was in one of these spaces, right behind the body of the royal guard, that Marise was now staring. She would never know that the royal guard had crawled here on purpose just before he was stabbed in the heart by the murderous Spaniard. We'll stop there. Okay. All right. You guys enjoying this? I'm enjoying it. <clears throat> my voice is gone, apparently. I t talked with my child or did something or yelled or drank too much coffee. I don't know. It's getting crackly. It's not it's not your headphones, it's my voice. Okay. Well, let's see. Recording dropped one frame. I can live with that. And this one, what did you do? You're averaging Oh yeah, it's not too bad. I can live with that too. All right. I will see you guys on the next one. Oh it's Thursday, so tomorrow will be Friday. Oh my goodness. Friday. This week just flew by. The quarantine just makes time like not matter as much anymore, right? And oh my gosh, I gotta I gotta get back into shape. My back has been sore all day long because all I've been doing is sitting around. I got some stuff I can share with you. Some really cool stuff too. All right, see y'all next time. Just the facts, ma'am.